In the cacophony of our modern lives, amidst the relentless beat of challenges, how often have we yearned for a shield, something to guard our spirit and grant us the resilience to march through the toughest storms? The answer, surprisingly, might lie not in the future, but in the distant past, in the pages of letters penned by a Stoic philosopher, Seneca. Resilience. It's a term that's often thrown around in motivational speeches and self-help books. But what does it truly mean to be resilient? Is it about never falling? Or is it about rising every time you fall? The Stoics had a unique perspective on this, viewing resilience not as an inborn trait, but as a skill, a muscle that can be developed and strengthened through practice, introspection, and most importantly, understanding. Through the treasure trove of Seneca's letters, we will discover that the Stoic concept of resilience is intertwined with our understanding of life, death, health, and the very nature of challenges themselves. These are not just static concepts, but dynamic forces that shape our existence. By understanding them, we don't just become resilient, we become empowered. Today, we'll explore five of Seneca's letters that specifically delve into the heart of human endurance. From confronting our baseless fears and truly understanding the nature of life's ultimate challenge, to realizing the profound relationship between our mental fortitude and physical well-being, these letters are packed with insights that are strikingly relevant to our contemporary challenges. Each letter a reflection of Seneca's own experiences and observations serves as a beacon illuminating the path to true resilience. They urge us to shift our perspective to see challenges not as insurmountable obstacles but as opportunities for growth. They teach us that the true strength of a person is not revealed in moments of comfort and convenience, but in the face of adversity and uncertainty. Today's journey is not just about reading ancient letters, it's about internalizing a philosophy that can make us unshakable. It's about understanding the difference between being broken and being forged. And most importantly, it's about realizing that resilience is not a gift, it's a choice. So as we venture forth into this exploration, I invite you to open not just your ears, but your hearts and minds. For what we're about to uncover is not just ancient wisdom, but timeless tools for a life of strength, dignity, and unyielding resilience. Letter 13 on Groundless Fears I know that you have plenty of spirit, for even before you began to equip yourself with maxims which were wholesome and potent to overcome obstacles, you were taking pride in your contest with fortune. And this is all the more true, now that you have grappled with fortune and tested your powers. For our powers can never inspire in us implicit faith in ourselves, except when many difficulties have confronted us on this side and on that, and have occasionally even come to close quarters with us. It is only in this way that the true spirit can be tested, the spirit that will never consent to come under the jurisdiction of things external to ourselves. This is the touchstone of such a spirit. No prize fighter can go with high spirits into the strife if he has never been beaten black and blue. The only contestant who can confidently enter the lists is the man who has seen his own blood, who has felt his teeth rattle beneath his opponent's fist, who has been tripped and felt the full force of his adversary's charge, who has been downed in body but not in spirit, one who, as often as he falls, rises again with greater defiance than ever. So then, to keep up my figure, fortune has often in the past got the upper hand of you and yet you have not surrendered, but have leaped up and stood your ground still more eagerly. For manliness gains much strength by being challenged. Nevertheless, if you approve, Allow me to offer some additional safeguards by which you may fortify yourself. There are more things, Lucilius, likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more often in imagination than in reality. I'm not speaking with you in the Stoic strain, but in my milder style, for it is our Stoic fashion to speak of all those things which provoke cries and groans as unimportant and beneath notice, 
but you and I must drop such great sounding words, although heaven knows they are true enough. What I advise you to do is not to be unhappy before the crisis comes, since it may be that the dangers before which you paled as if they were threatening you will never come upon you. They certainly have not yet come. Accordingly, some things torment us more than they ought, some torment us before they ought, and some torment us when they ought not to torment us at all. We are in the habit of exaggerating or imagining or anticipating sorrow. The first of these three faults may be postponed for the present because the subject is under discussion and the case is still in court, so to speak. That which I should call trifling, you will maintain to be most serious, for of course I know that some men laugh while being flogged and that others wince at a box on the ear. We shall consider later whether these evils derive their power from their own strength or from our own weakness. Do me the favor, when men surround you and try to talk you into believing that you are unhappy, to consider not what you hear, but what you yourself feel, and to take counsel with your feelings and question yourself independently, because you know your own affairs better than anyone else does. Ask, is there any reason why these persons should condole with me? Why should they be worried or even fear some infection from me, as if troubles could be transmitted? Is there any evil involved, or is it a matter merely of ill report, rather than an evil. Put the question voluntarily to yourself. Am I tormented without sufficient reason? Am I morose? And do I convert what is not an evil into what is an evil? You may retort with the question, how am I to know whether my sufferings are real or imaginary? Here is the rule for such matters. We are tormented either by things present or by things to come or by both. As to things present, the decision is easy. Suppose that your person enjoys freedom and health, and that you do not suffer from any external injury. As to what may happen to it in the future, we shall see later on. Today there is nothing wrong with it, but, you say, something will happen to it. First of all, consider whether your proofs of future trouble are sure, for it is more often the case that we are troubled by our apprehensions, and that we are mocked by that mocker rumor, which is wont to settle wars, but much more often settles individuals. Yes, my dear Lucilius, we agree too quickly with what people say. We do not put to the test those things which cause our fear. We do not examine into them. We blench and retreat just like soldiers who are forced to abandon their camp because of a dust cloud raised by stampeding cattle, or are thrown into a panic by the spreading of some unauthenticated rumor. And somehow or other it is the idle report that disturbs us most. For truth has its own definite boundaries, but that which arises from uncertainty is delivered over to guesswork and the irresponsible license of a frightened mind. That is why no fear is so ruinous and so uncontrollable as panic fear. For other fears are groundless, but this fear is witless. Let us then look carefully into the matter. It is likely that some troubles will befall us, but it is not a present fact. How often has the unexpected happened? How often has the expected never come to pass? And even though it is ordained to be, what does it avail to run out to meet your suffering? You will suffer soon enough when it arrives, so look forward meanwhile to better things. What shall you gain by doing this? Time. There will be many happenings meanwhile which will serve to postpone or end or pass on to another person, the trials which are near or even in your very presence. A fire has opened the way to flight. Men have been let down softly by a catastrophe. Sometimes the sword has been checked even at the victim's throat. Men have survived their own executioners. Even bad fortune is fickle. Perhaps it will come, perhaps not. In the meantime, it is not. So look forward to better things. The mind at times fashions for itself false shapes of evil when there are no signs that point to any evil. It twists into the worst construction some word of doubtful meaning or it fancies some personal grudge to be more serious than it really is, considering not how angry the enemy is, but to what lengths he may go if he is angry. But life is not worth living, and there is no limit to our sorrows, if we indulge our fears to the greatest possible extent. In this matter, let prudence help you, and contemn with a resolute spirit even when it is in plain sight. If you cannot do this, counter one weakness with another, and temper your fear with hope. 
There is nothing so certain among these objects of fear that it is not more certain still that things we dread sink into nothing and that things we hope for mock us. Accordingly, weigh carefully your hopes as well as your fears, and whenever all the elements are in doubt, decide in your own favor. Believe what you prefer, and if fear wins a majority of the votes, incline in the other direction anyhow, and cease to harass your soul, reflecting continually that most mortals, even when no troubles are actually at hand, or are certainly to be expected in the future, become excited and disquieted. No one calls a halt on himself when he begins to be urged ahead, nor does he regulate his alarm according to the truth. No one says, the author of the story is a fool, and he who has believed it is a fool, as well as he who fabricated it. We let ourselves drift with every breeze. We are frightened at uncertainties, just as if they were certain. We observe no moderation. The slightest thing turns the scales and throws us forthwith into a panic but I am ashamed either to admonish you sternly or to try to beguile you with such mild remedies. Let another say, perhaps the worst will not happen. You yourself must say, well, what if it does happen? Let us see who wins. Perhaps it happens for my best interests. It may be that such a death will shed credit upon my life. Socrates was ennobled by the hemlock draft, wrench from Cato's hand his sword, the vindicator of liberty, and you deprive him of the greatest share of his glory. I am exhorting you far too long, since you need reminding rather than exhortation. The path on which I am leading you is not different from that on which your nature leads you. You were born to such conduct as I describe. Hence, there is all the more reason why you should increase and beautify the good that is in you. But now to close my letter, I have only to stamp the usual seal upon it, in other words, to commit thereto some noble message to be delivered to you. The fool with all his other faults has this also, he is always getting ready to live. Reflect, my esteemed Lucilius, what this saying means, and you will see how revolting is the fickleness of men who lay down every day new foundations of life and begin to build up fresh hopes even at the brink of the grave. Look within your own mind for individual instances. You will think of old men who are preparing themselves at that very hour for a political career, or for travel or for business. And what is baser than getting ready to live when you are already old? I should not name the author of this motto, except that it is somewhat unknown to fame and is not one of those popular sayings of Epicurus which I have allowed myself to praise and to appropriate. Farewell. Letter 24 on despising death. You write me that you are anxious about the result of a lawsuit with which an angry opponent is threatening you, and you expect me to advise you to picture to yourself a happier issue and to rest in the allurements of hope. Why indeed is it necessary to summon trouble, which must be endured soon enough when it has once arrived, or to anticipate trouble and ruin the present through fear of the future? It is indeed foolish to be unhappy now, because you may be unhappy at some future time, but I shall conduct you to peace of mind by another route. If you would put off all worry, assume that what you fear may happen will certainly happen in any event. Whatever the trouble may be, measure it in your own mind, and estimate the amount of your fear. You will thus understand that what you fear is either insignificant or short-lived and you need not spend a long time in gathering illustrations which will strengthen you. Every epoch has produced them. Let your thoughts travel into any era of Roman or foreign history, and there will throng before you notable examples of high achievement or of high endeavor. If you lose this case, can anything more severe happen to you than being sent into exile or led to prison? Is there a worse fate that any man may fear than being burned or being killed? Name such penalties one by one, and mention the men who have scorned them. One does not need to hunt for them. It is simply a matter of selection. Sentence of conviction was borne by Rutilius as if the injustice of the decision were the only thing which annoyed him. Exile was endured by Metellus with courage, by Rutilius even with gladness, for the former consented to come back only because his country called him. 
the latter refused to return when Sulla summoned him, and nobody in those days said no to Sulla. Socrates in prison discoursed and declined to flee when certain persons gave him the opportunity. He remained there in order to free mankind from the fear of two most grievous things, death and imprisonment. Musius put his hand into the fire. It is painful to be burned, but how much more painful to inflict such suffering upon oneself. Here was a man of no learning, not primed to face death and pain by any words of wisdom, and equipped only with the courage of a soldier who punished himself for his fruitless daring. He stood and watched his own right hand falling away piecemeal on the enemy's brazier, and nor did he withdraw the dissolving limb with its uncovered bones until his foe removed the fire. He might have accomplished something more successful in that camp, but never anything more brave. See how much keener a brave man is to lay hold of danger than a cruel man is to inflict it. Porsena was more ready to pardon Mucius for wishing to slay him than Mucius to pardon himself for failing to slay Porsena. Oh, say you, those stories have been drawn to death in all the schools. Pretty soon, when you reach the topic on despising death, you will be telling me about Cato. But why should I not tell you about Cato? How he read Plato's book on that last glorious night, with a sword laid at his pillow. He had provided these two requisites for his last moments. The first, that he might have the will to die, and the second, that he might have the means. So he put his affairs in order, as well as one could put in order that which was ruined and near its end, and thought that he ought to see to it that no one should have the power to slay or the good fortune to save Cato. Drawing the sword, which he had kept unstained from all bloodshed against the final day, he cried, Fortune, you have accomplished nothing by resisting all my endeavors. I have fought, till now, for my country's freedom and not for my own. I did not strive so doggedly to be free, but only to live among the free. Now since the affairs of mankind are beyond hope, let Cato be withdrawn to safety. So saying, he inflicted a mortal wound upon his body. After the physicians had bound it up, Cato had less blood and less strength, but no less courage. Angered now not only at Caesar, but also at himself, he rallied his unarmed hands against his wound, and expelled, rather than dismissed, that noble soul which had been so defiant of all worldly power. I am not now heaping up these illustrations for the purpose of exercising my wit, but for the purpose of encouraging you to face that which is thought to be most terrible. And I shall encourage you all the more easily, by showing that not only resolute men have despised that moment when the soul breathes its last, but that certain persons, who were craven in other respects, have equaled in this regard the courage of the bravest. Take, for example, Scipio, the father-in-law of Gnaeus Pompeius. He was driven back upon the African coast by a headwind and saw his ship in the power of the enemy. He therefore pierced his body with a sword, and when they asked where the commander was, he replied, all is well with the commander. These words brought him up to the level of his ancestors and suffered not the glory which fate gave to the Scipios in Africa to lose its continuity. It was a great deed to conquer Carthage, but a greater deed to conquer death. All is well with the commander. Ought a general to die otherwise, especially one of Cato's generals? I shall not refer you to history or collect examples of those men who throughout the ages have despised death for they are very many. Consider these times of ours, whose enervation and over-refinement call forth our complaints. They nevertheless will include men of every rank, of every lot in life and of every age, who have cut short their misfortunes by death. Believe me, Lucilius, death is so little to be feared that through its good offices, nothing is to be feared. Therefore, when your enemy threatens, listen unconcernedly. Although your conscience makes you confident, Yet, since many things have weight which are outside your case, both hope for that which is utterly just and prepare yourself against that which is utterly unjust. Remember, however, before all else, to strip things of all that disturbs and confuses and to see what each is at bottom. You will then comprehend that they contain nothing fearful except the actual fear. That you see happening to boys happens also to ourselves, who are only slightly bigger boys. When those whom they love with whom they daily associate, with whom they play, appear with masks on, the boys are frightened out of their wits. We should strip the mask, 
not only from men, but from things, and restore to each object its own aspect. Why dost thou hold up before my eyes swords, fires, and a throng of executioners raging about thee? Take away all that vain show behind which thou lurkest and scarest fools. Ah, thou art naught but death, whom only yesterday a manservant of mine and a maidservant did despise. Why dost thou again unfold and spread before me with all that great display, the whip and the rack? Why are those engines of torture made ready, one for each several member of the body, and all the other innumerable machines for tearing a man apart piecemeal? Away with all such stuff, which makes us numb with terror, and thou silence the groans, the cries, and the bitter shrieks ground out of the victim as he is torn on the rack. Forsooth thou art naught but pain, scorned by yonder gout-ridden wretch, endured by yonder dyspeptic in the midst of his dainties, borne bravely by the girl in travail. Slight thou art, if I can bear thee, short thou art, if I cannot bear thee. Ponder these words which you have often heard and often uttered. Moreover, prove by the result whether that which you have heard and uttered is true. For there is a very disgraceful charge often brought against our school that we deal with the words and not with the deeds of philosophy. What, have you only at this moment learned that death is hanging over your head, at this moment exile, at this moment grief, you were born to these perils? Let us think of everything that can happen as something which will happen. I know that you have really done what I advise you to do. I now warn you not to drown your soul in these petty anxieties of yours. If you do, the soul will be dulled and will have too little vigor left when the time comes for it to arise. Remove the mind from this case of yours to the case of men in general. Say to yourself that our petty bodies are mortal and frail. Pain can reach them from other sources than from wrong or the might of the stronger. Our pleasures themselves become torments, banquets bring indigestion, carousals paralysis of the muscles and palsy, sensual habits affect the feet, the hands and every joint of the body. I may become a poor man. I shall then be one among many. I may be exiled. I shall then regard myself as born in the place to which I shall be sent. They may put me in chains. What then? Am I free from bonds now? Behold this clogging burden of a body to which nature has fettered me. I shall die, you say. You mean to say, I shall cease to run the risk of sickness. I shall cease to run the risk of imprisonment. I shall cease to run the risk of death. I am not so foolish as to go through at this juncture the arguments which Epicurus harps upon and say that the terrors of the world below are idle, that Ixion does not whirl round on his wheel, that Sisyphus does not shoulder his stone uphill, that a man's entrails cannot be restored and devoured every day. No one is so childish as to fear Cerberus, or the shadows, or the spectral garb of those who are held together by naught but their unfleshed bones. Death either annihilates us or strips us bare. If we are then released, there remains the better part, after the burden has been withdrawn. If we are annihilated, nothing remains. Good and bad are alike removed. Allow me at this point to quote a verse of yours, first suggesting that, when you wrote it, you meant it for yourself, no less than for others. It is ignoble to say one thing and mean another, and how much more ignoble to write one thing and mean another. I remember one day you were handling the well-known commonplace that we do not suddenly fall on death but advance towards it by slight degrees. We die every day. For every day a little of our life is taken from us. Even when we are growing, our life is on the wane. We lose our childhood, then our boyhood, and then our youth. Counting even yesterday, all past time is lost time. The very day which we are now spending is shared between ourselves and death. It is not the last drop that empties the water clock, but all that which previously has flowed out. Similarly, the final hour when we cease to exist does not of itself bring death. It merely of itself completes the death process. We reach death at that moment, but we have been a long time on the way. In describing this situation, you said in your customary style, for you are always impressive, but never more pungent than when you are putting the truth in appropriate words. Not single is the death which comes. The death which takes us off is but the last of all. I prefer that you should read your own words rather than my letter, for then it will be clear to you that this death, of which we are afraid, 
is the last but not the only death. I see what you are looking for. You are asking what I have packed into my letter, what inspiriting saying from some mastermind, what useful precept. So I shall send you something dealing with this very subject which has been under discussion. Epicurus upbraids those who crave as much as those who shrink from death. It is absurd, he says, to run towards death because you are tired of life, when it is your manner of life that has made you run towards death. And in another passage, what is so absurd as to seek death, when it is through fear of death that you have robbed your life of peace? And you may add a third statement of the same stamp. Men are so thoughtless, nay so mad, that some, through fear of death, force themselves to die. Whichever of these ideas you ponder, you will strengthen your mind for the endurance alike of death and of life, for we need to be warned and strengthened in both directions, not to love or to hate life overmuch, even when reason advises us to make an end of it, the impulse is not to be adopted without reflection or at headlong speed. The grave and wise man should not beat a hasty retreat from life, he should make a becoming exit, and above all, he should avoid the weakness which has taken possession of so many, the lust for death. For just as there is an unreflecting tendency of the mind towards other things, so my dear Lucilius, there is an unreflecting tendency towards death. This often seizes upon the noblest and most spirited men, as well as upon the craven and the abject. The former despise life, the latter find it irksome. Others also are moved by a satiety of doing and seeing the same things, and not so much by a hatred of life as because they are cloyed with it. We slip into this condition, while philosophy itself pushes us on, and we say, how long must I endure the same things? Shall I continue to wake and sleep? be hungry and be cloyed, shiver and perspire. There is an end to nothing. All things are connected in a sort of circle. They flee and they are pursued. Night is close at the heels of day, day at the heels of night. Summer ends in autumn, winter rushes after autumn, and winter softens into spring. All nature in this way passes only to return. I do nothing new, I see nothing new. Sooner or later one sickens of this also. There are many who think that living is not painful, but superfluous. Farewell. Letter 71 on the Supreme Good You are continually referring special questions to me, forgetting that a vast stretch of sea sunders us. Since, however, the value of advice depends mostly on the time when it is given, it must necessarily result that by the time my opinion on certain matters reaches you, the opposite opinion is the better. For advice conforms to circumstances, and our circumstances are carried along, or rather whirled along. Accordingly, advice should be produced at short notice, and even this is too late. It should grow while we work, as the saying is, and I propose to show you how you may discover the method. As often as you wish to know what is to be avoided or what is to be sought, consider its relation to the supreme good, to the purpose of your whole life. For whatever we do ought to be in harmony with this. No man can set in order the details unless he has already set before himself the chief purpose of his life. The artist may have his colors all prepared, but he cannot produce a likeness unless he has already made up his mind what he wishes to paint. The reason we make mistakes is because we all consider the parts of life, but never life as a whole. The archer must know what he is seeking to hit, then he must aim and control the weapon by his skill. Our plans miscarry because they have no aim. When a man does not know what harbor he is making for, no wind is the right wind. Chance must necessarily have great influence over our lives, because we live by chance. It is the case with certain men, however, that they do not know that they know certain things. Just as we often go searching for those who stand beside us, so we are apt to forget that the goal of the supreme good lies near us. To infer the nature of this supreme good, one does not need many words or any roundabout discussion. It should be pointed out with the forefinger, so to speak, and not be dissipated into many parts. For what good is there in breaking it up into tiny bits, when you can say, the supreme good is that which is honorable? 
Besides, and you may be still more surprised at this, that which is honorable is the only good. All other goods are alloyed and debased. If you once convince yourself of this, and if you come to love virtue devotedly, for mere loving is not enough, anything that has been touched by virtue will be fraught with blessing and prosperity for you, no matter how it shall be regarded by others. Torture, if only as you lie suffering, you are more calm in mind than your very torturer. Illness, if only you curse not fortune and yield not to the disease, in short, all those things which others regard as ills will become manageable and will end in good if you succeed in rising above them. Let this once be clear that there is nothing good except that which is honorable, and all hardships will have a just title to the name of goods when once virtue has made them honorable. Many think that we Stoics are holding out expectations greater than our human lot admits of, and they have a right to think so, for they have regard to the body only, but let them turn back to the soul and they will soon measure man by the standard of God. Rouse yourself, most excellent Lucilius, and leave off all this wordplay of the philosophers who reduce a most glorious subject to a matter of syllables, and lower and wear out the soul by teaching fragments, then you will become like the men who discovered these precepts. Instead of those who by their teaching do their best to make philosophy seem difficult rather than great, Socrates, who recalled the whole of philosophy to rules of conduct and asserted that the highest wisdom consisted in distinguishing between good and evil, said, Follow these rules, if my words carry weight with you, in order that you may be happy, and let some men think you even a fool. Allow any man who so desires to insult you and work you wrong, but if only virtue dwells with you, you will suffer nothing. If you wish to be happy, if you would be in good faith a good man, let one person or another despise you. No man can accomplish this unless he has come to regard all goods as equal, for the reason that no good exists without that which is honorable, and that which is honorable is in every case equal. You may say, what then? Is there no difference between Cato's being elected praetor and his failure at the polls, or whether Cato is conquered or conqueror in the battle line of Pharsalia? And when Cato could not be defeated, though his party met defeat, was not this goodness of his equal to that which would have been his if he had returned victorious to his native land and arranged a peace? Of course it was, for it is by the same virtue that evil fortune is overcome and good fortune is controlled. Virtue, however, cannot be increased or decreased. Its stature is uniform. But, you will object, Gnaeus Pompey will lose his army. The patricians, those noblest patterns of the state's creation, and the front-rank men of Pompey's party, a senate under arms, will be rooted in a single engagement. The ruins of that great oligarchy will be scattered all over the world. One division will fall in Egypt, another in Africa, and another in Spain, and the poor state will not be allowed even the privilege of being ruined once for all. Yes, all this may happen. Juba's familiarity with every position in his own kingdom may be of no avail to him of no avail the resolute bravery of his people when fighting for their king. Even the men of Utica, crushed by their troubles, may waver in their allegiance, and the good fortune which ever attended men of the name of Scipio may desert Scipio in Africa. But long ago, destiny saw to it that Cato should come to no harm. He was conquered in spite of it all. Well, you may include this among Cato's failures, Cato will bear with an equally stout heart anything that thwarts him of his victory, as he bore that which thwarted him of his praetorship. The day whereon he failed of election, he spent in play. The night wherein he intended to die, he spent in reading. He regarded in the same light both the loss of his praetorship and the loss of his life. He had convinced himself that he ought to endure anything which might happen. Why should he not suffer, bravely and calmly, a change in the government? For what is free from the risk of change? Neither earth, nor sky, nor the whole fabric of our universe, though it be controlled by the hand of God. It will not always preserve its present order. It will be thrown from its course in days to come. All things move in accord with their appointed times. They are destined to be born, to grow, and to be destroyed. The stars which you see moving above us, and this seemingly immovable earth to which we cling and on which we are set, will be consumed and will cease to exist. There is nothing that does not have its old age. 
the intervals are merely unequal, at which nature sends forth all these things towards the same goal. Whatever is will cease to be, and yet it will not perish, but will be resolved into its elements. To our minds, this process means perishing, for we behold only that which is nearest. Our sluggish mind, under allegiance to the body, does not penetrate to bourns beyond. Were it not so, the mind would endure with greater courage its own ending and that of its possessions, if only it could hope that life and death, like the whole universe about us, go by turns, that whatever has been put together is broken up again, that whatever has been broken up is put together again, and that the eternal craftsmanship of God, who controls all things, is working at this task. Therefore the wise man will say just what a Marcus Cato would say, after reviewing his past life. The whole race of man, both that which is and that which is to be, is condemned to die. Of all the cities that at any time have held sway over the world and of all that have been the splendid ornaments of empires not their own, men shall someday ask where they were, and they shall be swept away by destructions of various kinds. Some shall be ruined by wars, others shall be wasted away by inactivity and by the kind of peace which ends in sloth, or by that vice which is fraught with destruction even for mighty dynasties, luxury. All these fertile plains shall be buried out of sight by a sudden overflowing of the sea, or a slipping of the soil as it settles to lower levels, shall draw them suddenly into a yawning chasm. Why then should I be angry or feel sorrow if I precede the general destruction by a tiny interval of time? Let great souls comply with God's wishes and suffer unhesitatingly whatever fate the law of the universe ordains. For the soul at death is either sent forth into a better life, destined to dwell with deity amid greater radiance and calm, or else, at least without suffering any harm to itself, it will be mingled with nature again and will return to the universe. Therefore Cato's honorable death was no less a good than his honorable life, since virtue admits of no stretching. Socrates used to say that verity and virtue were the same. Just as truth does not grow, so neither does virtue grow, for it has its due proportions and is complete. You need not therefore wonder that goods are equal, both those which are to be deliberately chosen and those which circumstances have imposed. For if you once adopt the view that they are unequal, deeming, for instance, a brave endurance of torture as among the lesser goods, you will be including it among the evils also. You will pronounce Socrates unhappy in his prison, Cato unhappy when he reopens his wounds with more courage than he allowed in inflicting them, and Regulus, the most ill-starred of all, when he pays the penalty for keeping his word even with his enemies. And yet no man, even the most effeminate person in the world, has ever dared to maintain such an opinion. For though such persons deny that a man like Regulus is happy, Yet for all that they also deny that he is wretched. The earlier academics do indeed admit that a man is happy even amid such tortures, but do not admit that he is completely or fully happy. With this view we cannot in any wise agree. For unless a man is happy, he has not attained the supreme good, and the good which is supreme admits of no higher degree. If only virtue exists within this man, and if adversity does not impair his virtue, and if, though the body be injured, the virtue abides unharmed, and it does abide. For I understand virtue to be high-spirited and exalted, so that it is aroused by anything that molests it. This spirit, which young men of noble breeding often assume when they are so deeply stirred by the beauty of some honorable object that they despise all the gifts of chance, is assuredly infused in us and communicated to us by wisdom. Wisdom will bring the conviction that there is but one good, that which is honorable that this can neither be shortened nor extended, any more than a carpenter's rule with which straight lines are tested can be bent. Any change in the rule means spoiling the straight line. Applying therefore this same figure to virtue, we shall say, virtue also is straight and admits of no bending. What can be made more tense than a thing which is already rigid? Such is virtue which passes judgment on everything, but nothing passes judgment on virtue. And if this rule, virtue, cannot itself be made more straight, neither can the things created by virtue be in one case straighter and in another less straight. For they must necessarily correspond to virtue, 
hence they are equal. What, you say, do you call reclining at a banquet and submitting to torture equally good? Does this seem surprising to you? You may be still more surprised at the following, that reclining at a banquet is an evil, while reclining on the rack is a good, if the former act is done in a shameful, and the latter in an honorable manner. It is not the material that makes these actions good or bad, it is the virtue. All acts in which virtue has disclosed itself are of the same measure and value. At this moment the man who measures the souls of all men by his own is shaking his fist in my face because I hold that there is a parity between the goods involved in the case of one who passes sentence honorably and of one who suffers sentence honorably, or because I hold that there is a parity between the goods of one who celebrates a triumph and of one who, unconquered in spirit, is carried before the victor's chariot. For such critics think that whatever they themselves cannot do is not done. They pass judgment on virtue in the light of their own weaknesses. Why do you marvel if it helps a man, and on occasion even pleases him, to be burned, wounded, slain, or bound in prison? To a luxurious man a simple life is a penalty. To a lazy man work is punishment. The dandy pities the diligent man. To the slothful studies are torture. Similarly, we regard those things with respect to which we are all infirm of disposition, as hard and beyond endurance, forgetting what a torment it is to many men to abstain from wine or to be routed from their beds at break of day. These actions are not essentially difficult. It is we ourselves that are soft and flabby. We must pass judgment concerning great matters with greatness of soul. Otherwise, that which is really our fault will seem to be their fault. So it is that certain objects which are perfectly straight when sunk in water appear to the onlooker as bent or broken off. It matters not only what you see, but with what eyes you see it. Our souls are too dull of vision to perceive the truth. But give me an unspoiled and sturdy-minded young man, he will pronounce more fortunate one who sustains on unbending shoulders the whole weight of adversity, who stands out superior to fortune. It is not a cause for wonder that one is not tossed about when the weather is calm, Reserve your wonderment for cases where a man is lifted up when all others sink and keeps his footing when all others are prostrate. What element of evil is there in torture and in the other things which we call hardships? It seems to me that there is this evil, that the mind sags and bends and collapses. But none of these things can happen to the sage. He stands erect under any load. Nothing can subdue him. Nothing that must be endured annoys him for he does not complain that he has been struck by that which can strike any man. He knows his own strength, he knows that he was born to carry burdens. I do not withdraw the wise man from the category of man, nor do I deny to him the sense of pain, as though he were a rock that has no feelings at all. I remember that he is made up of two parts. The one part is irrational. It is this that may be bitten, burned or hurt. The other part is rational. It is this which holds resolutely to opinions, is courageous and unconquerable. In the latter is situated man's supreme good. Before this is completely attained, the mind wavers in uncertainty. Only when it is fully achieved is the mind fixed and steady. And so when one has just begun or is on one's way to the heights and is cultivating virtue, or even if one is drawing near the perfect good but has not yet put the finishing touch upon it, one will retrograde at times and there will be a certain slackening of mental effort. For such a man has not yet traversed the doubtful ground, he is still standing in slippery places. But the happy man whose virtue is complete loves himself most of all when his bravery has been submitted to the severest test and when he not only endures but welcomes that which all other men regard with fear if it is the price which he must pay for the performance of a duty which honor imposes. And he greatly prefers to have men say of him how much more noble rather than how much more lucky. And now I have reached the point to which your patient waiting summons me. You must not think that our human virtue transcends nature. The wise man will tremble, will feel pain, will turn pale. For all these are sensations of the body. Where then is the abode of utter distress, of that which is truly an evil? In the other part of us, no doubt. If it is the mind that these trials drag down, forced to a confession of its servitude and caused to regret its existence. 
The wise man indeed overcomes fortune by his virtue, but many who profess wisdom are sometimes frightened by the most unsubstantial threats. And at this stage, it is a mistake on our part to make the same demands upon the wise man and upon the learner. I still exhort myself to do that which I recommend, but my exhortations are not yet followed. And even if this were the case, I should not have these principles so ready for practice or so well trained that they would rush to my assistance in every crisis. Just as wool takes up certain colors at once, while there are others which it will not absorb unless it is soaked and steeped in them many times, so other systems of doctrine can be immediately applied by men's minds after once being accepted. But this system of which I speak, unless it has gone deep and has sunk in for a long time, and has not merely colored, but thoroughly permeated the soul, does not fulfill any of its promises. The matter can be imparted quickly and in very few words. Virtue is the only good. At any rate, there is no good without virtue, and virtue itself is situated in our nobler part, that is, the rational part. And what will this virtue be? A true and never swerving judgment, for therefrom will spring all mental impulses, and by its agency, every external appearance that stirs our impulses will be clarified. It will be in keeping with this judgment to judge all things that have been colored by virtue as goods and as equal goods. Bodily goods are, to be sure, good for the body, but they are not absolutely good. There will indeed be some value in them, but they will possess no genuine merit, for they will differ greatly. Some will be less, others greater. And we are constrained to acknowledge that there are great differences among the very followers of wisdom. One man has already made so much progress that he dares to raise his eyes and look fortune in the face, but not persistently, for his eyes soon drop, dazzled by her overwhelming splendor. Another has made so much progress that he is able to match glances with her, that is, unless he has already reached the summit and is full of confidence. That which is short of perfection must necessarily be unsteady, at one time progressing, at another slipping or growing faint and it will surely slip back unless it keeps struggling ahead. For if a man slackens at all in zeal and faithful application, he must retrograde. No one can resume his progress at the point where he left off. Therefore, let us press on and persevere. There remains much more of the road than we have put behind us, but the greater part of progress is the desire to progress. I fully understand what this task is. It is a thing which I desire and I desire it with all my heart. I see that you also have been aroused and are hastening with great zeal towards infinite beauty. Let us then hasten. Only on these terms will life be a boon to us. Otherwise there is delay, and indeed disgraceful delay, while we busy ourselves with revolting things. Let us see to it that all time belongs to us. This, however, cannot be unless first of all our own selves begin to belong to us. And when will it be our privilege to despise both kinds of fortune? When will it be our privilege, after all the passions have been subdued and brought under our own control, to utter the words, I have conquered? Do you ask me whom I have conquered? Neither the Persians nor the far-off Medes, nor any warlike race that lies beyond the Dahai. Not these, but greed, ambition, and the fear of death that has conquered the conquerors of the world. Letter 78 On the Healing Power of the Mind That you are frequently troubled by the snuffling of catarrh and by short attacks of fever which follow after long and chronic catarrhal seizures, I am sorry to hear, particularly because I have experienced this sort of illness myself and scorned it in its early stages. For when I was still young, I could put up with hardships and show a bold front to illness. But I finally succumbed and arrived at such a state that I could do nothing but snuffle, reduced as I was to the extremity of thinness. I often entertained the impulse of ending my life then and there, but the thought of my kind old father kept me back. For I reflected not how bravely I had the power to die, but how little power he had to bear bravely the loss of me, and so I commanded myself to live, for sometimes it is an act of bravery even to live. 
Now I shall tell you what consoled me during those days, stating at the outset that these very aids to my peace of mind were as efficacious as medicine. Honorable consolation results in a cure, and whatever has uplifted the soul helps the body also. My studies were my salvation. I place it to the credit of philosophy that I recovered and regained my strength. I owe my life to philosophy and that is the least of my obligations. My friends too helped me greatly towards good health. I used to be comforted by their cheering words, by the hours they spent at my bedside, and by their conversation. Nothing, my excellent Ducilius, refreshes and aids a sick man so much as the affection of his friends. Nothing so steals away the expectation and the fear of death. In fact, I could not believe that if they survived me, I should be dying at all. Yes, I repeat, it seemed to me that I should continue to live, not with them, but through them. I imagine myself not to be yielding up my soul, but to be making it over to them. All these things gave me the inclination to succor myself and to endure any torture. Besides, it is a most miserable state to have lost one's zest for dying and to have no zest in living. These then are the remedies to which you should have recourse. The physician will prescribe your walks and your exercise. He will warn you not to become addicted to idleness as is the tendency of the inactive invalid. He will order you to read in a louder voice and to exercise your lungs the passages and cavity of which are affected, or to sail and shake up your bowels by a little mild motion. He will recommend the proper food and the suitable time for aiding your strength with wine or refraining from it in order to keep your cough from being irritated and hacking. But as for me, my counsel to you is this, and it is a cure not merely of this disease of yours, but of your whole life, despise death. There is no sorrow in the world when we have escaped from the fear of death. There are these three serious elements in every disease, fear of death, bodily pain, and interruption of pleasures. Concerning death enough has been said and I shall add only a word. This fear is not a fear of disease but a fear of nature. Disease has often postponed death and a vision of dying has been many a man's salvation. Uh, you will die, not because you are ill, but because you are alive. Even when you have been cured, the same end awaits you. When you have recovered, it will be not death, but ill health that you have escaped. Let us now return to the consideration of the characteristic disadvantage of disease. It is accompanied by great suffering. The suffering, however, is rendered endurable by interruptions, for the strain of extreme pain must come to an end. No man can suffer both severely and for a long time. Nature, who loves us most tenderly, has so constituted us as to make pain either endurable or short. The severest pains have their seat in the most slender parts of our body. Nerves, joints, and any other of the narrow passages hurt most cruelly when they have developed trouble within their contracted spaces. But these parts soon become numb and by reason of the pain itself lose the sensation of pain, whether because the life force, when checked in its natural course and changed for the worse, loses the peculiar power through which it thrives and through which it warns us, or because the diseased humors of the body, when they cease to have a place into which they may flow, are thrown back upon themselves and deprive of sensation the parts where they have caused congestion. So gout, both in the feet and in the hands, and all pain in the vertebrae and in the nerves, have their intervals of rest at the times when they have dulled the parts which they before had tortured. The first twinges in all such cases are what cause the distress and their onset is checked by lapse of time so that there is an end of pain when numbness has set in. Pain in the teeth, eyes and ears is most acute for the very reason that it begins among the narrow spaces of the body no less acute indeed than in the head itself, but if it is more violent than usual, it turns to delirium and stupor. This is, accordingly, a consolation for excessive pain that you cannot help ceasing to feel it if you feel it to excess. The reason, however, why the inexperienced are impatient when their bodies suffer is that they have not accustomed themselves to be contented in spirit. They have been closely associated with the body. Therefore, a high-minded and sensible man divorces soul from body and dwells much with the better or divine part and only as far as he must with this complaining and frail portion. But it is a hardship, men say, to do without our customary pleasures, to fast, to feel thirst and hunger. 
These are indeed serious when one first abstains from them. Later the desire dies down, because the appetites themselves which lead to desire are wearied and forsake us. Then the stomach becomes petulant, then the food which we craved before becomes hateful, our very wants die away. But there is no bitterness in doing without that which you have ceased to desire. Moreover, every pain sometimes stops, or at any rate, slackens. Moreover, one may take precautions against its return, and when it threatens, may check it by means of remedies. Every variety of pain has its premonitory symptoms. This is true at any rate of pain that is habitual and recurrent. One can endure the suffering which disease entails if one has come to regard its results with scorn. But do not of your own accord make your troubles heavier to bear and burden yourself with complaining. Pain is slight if opinion has added nothing to it. But if, on the other hand, you begin to encourage yourself and say it is nothing, a trifling matter at most, keep a stout heart and it will soon cease. Then in thinking it slight, you will make it slight. Everything depends on opinion, ambition, luxury, greed, hark back to opinion. It is according to opinion that we suffer. A man is as wretched as he has convinced himself that he is. I hold that we should do away with complaint about past sufferings and with all language like this. None has ever been worse off than I. What sufferings, what evils have I endured? No one has thought that I shall recover. How often have my family bewailed me and the physicians given me over? Men who are placed on the rack are not torn asunder with such agony. However, even if all this is true, it is over and gone. What benefit is there in reviewing past sufferings and in being unhappy just because once you were unhappy? Besides, everyone adds much to his own ills and tells lies to himself. And that which was bitter to bear is pleasant to have borne. It is natural to rejoice at the ending of one's ills. Two elements must therefore be rooted out once for all, the fear of future suffering and the recollection of past suffering, since the latter no longer concerns me and the former concerns me not yet. But when set in the very midst of troubles one should say, perchance some day the memory of this sorrow will even bring delight. Let such a man fight against them with all his might. If he once gives way, he will be vanquished, but if he strives against his sufferings, he will conquer. As it is, however, what most men do is to drag down upon their own heads a falling ruin which they ought to try to support. If you begin to withdraw your support from that which thrusts toward you and totters and is ready to plunge, it will follow you and lean more heavily upon you. But if you hold your ground and make up your mind to push against it, it will be forced back. What blows do athletes receive on their faces and all over their bodies? Nevertheless, through their desire for fame, they endure every torture, and they undergo these things not only because they are fighting, but in order to be able to fight. Their very training means torture. So let us also win the way to victory in all our struggles, for the reward is not a garland or a palm or a trumpeter who calls for silence at the proclamation of our names, but rather virtue, steadfastness of soul, and a peace that is won for all time, if fortune has once been utterly vanquished in any combat. You say, I feel severe pain. What then? Are you relieved from feeling it if you endure it like a woman? Just as an enemy is more dangerous to a retreating army, so every trouble that fortune brings attacks us all the harder if we yield and turn our backs. But the trouble is serious. What? Is it for this purpose that we are strong? That we may have light burdens to bear? Would you have your illness long drawn out? Or would you have it quick and short? If it is long, it means a respite, allows you a period for resting yourself, bestows upon you the boon of time in plenty. As it arises, so it must also subside. A short and rapid illness will do one of two things. It will quench or be quenched. And what difference does it make whether it is not or I am not? In either case, there is an end of pain. This too will help to turn the mind aside to thoughts of other things and thus to depart from pain. Call to mind what honorable or brave deeds you have done. Consider the good side of your own life. Run over in your memory those things which you have particularly admired. Then think of all the brave men who have conquered pain, of him who continued to read his book as he allowed the cutting out of varicose veins, of him who did not cease to smile, though that very smile so enraged his torturers that they tried upon him every instrument of their cruelty. 
If pain can be conquered by a smile, will it not be conquered by reason? You may tell me now of whatever you like of colds, bad coughing spells that bring up parts of our entrails, fever that parches our very vitals, thirst, limbs so twisted that the joints protrude in different directions. Yet worse than these are the stake, the rack, the red-hot plates, the instrument that reopens wounds while the wounds themselves are still swollen, and that drives their imprint still deeper. And nevertheless there have been men who have not uttered a moan amid these tortures. More yet, says the torturer, but the victim has not begged for release. More yet, he says again, but no answer has come. More yet. The victim has smiled, and heartily too. Can you not bring yourself after an example like this to make a mock at pain? But, you object, my illness does not allow me to be doing anything. It has withdrawn me from all my duties. It is your body that is hampered by ill health, and not your soul as well. It is for this reason that it clogs the feet of the runner and will hinder the handiwork of the cobbler or the artisan. But if your soul be habitually in practice, you will plead and teach, listen and learn, investigate and meditate. What more is necessary? Do you think that you are doing nothing if you possess self-control in your illness? You will be showing that a disease can be overcome, or at any rate endured. There is, I assure you, a place for virtue, even upon a bed of sickness. It is not only the sword and the battle line that prove the soul alert and unconquered by fear. A man can display bravery even when wrapped in his bedclothes. You have something to do. Wrestle bravely with disease. If it shall compel you to nothing, beguile you to nothing, it is a notable example that you display. Oh, what ample matter were there for renown if we could have spectators of our sickness. Be your own spectator, seek your own applause. Again, there are two kinds of pleasures. Disease checks the pleasures of the body, but does not do away with them. Nay, if the truth is to be considered, it serves to excite them. For the thirstier a man is, the more he enjoys a drink. The hungrier he is, the more pleasure he takes in food. Whatever falls to one's lot, after a period of abstinence, is welcomed with greater zest. The other kind, however, the pleasures of the mind, which are higher and less uncertain, no physician can refuse to the sick man. Whoever seeks these and knows well what they are, scorns all the blandishments of the senses. Men say, poor sick fellow, but why? Is it because he does not mix snow with his wine, or because he does not revive the chill of his drink, mixed as it is in a good-sized bowl, by chipping ice into it, or because he does not have lucrine oysters opened fresh at his table? or because there is no din of cooks about his dining hall as they bring in their very cooking apparatus along with their viands. For luxury has already devised this fashion of having the kitchen accompany the dinner so that the food may not grow lukewarm or fail to be hot enough for a palate which has already become hardened. Poor sick fellow. He will eat as much as he can digest. There will be no boar lying before his eyes, banished from the table as if it were a common meat, and on his sideboard there will be heaped together no breast meat of birds, because it sickens him to see birds served whole. But what evil has been done to you? You will dine like a sick man, nay, sometimes like a sound man. All these things, however, can be easily endured. Gruel, warm water, and anything else that seems insupportable to a fastidious man, to one who is wallowing in luxury, sick in soul rather than in body. If only we cease to shudder at death, and we shall cease if once we have gained a knowledge of the limits of good and evil, then and then only, life will not weary us, neither will death make us afraid. For surfeit of self can never seize upon a life that surveys all the things which are manifold, great, divine. Only idle leisure is wont to make men hate their lives. To one who roams through the universe, the truth can never pall. It will be the untruths that will cloy, and on the other hand, if death comes near with its summons, even though it be untimely in its arrival, though it cut one off in one's prime, a man has had a taste of all that the longest life can give. Such a man has in great measure come to understand the universe. He knows that honorable things do not depend on time for their growth, but any life must seem short to those who measure its length by pleasures which are empty and for that reason unbounded. Refresh yourself with such thoughts as these, and meanwhile reserve some hours for our letters. 
There will come a time when we shall be united again and brought together. However short this time may be, we shall make it long by knowing how to employ it. For as Posidonius says, a single day among the learned lasts longer than the longest life of the ignorant. Meanwhile, hold fast to this thought and grip it close. Yield not to adversity, trust not to prosperity. Keep before your eyes the full scope of fortune's power as if she would surely do whatever is in her power to do. That which has been long expected comes more gently. Farewell. Letter 104 On Care of Health and Peace of Mind I have run off to my villa at Nomentum. For what purpose do you suppose? To escape the city? No, to shake off a fever which was surely working its way into my system. It had already got a grip upon me. My physician kept insisting that when the circulation was upset and irregular, disturbing the natural poise, the disease was underway. I therefore ordered my carriage to be made ready at once, and insisted on departing in spite of my wife Paulina's effort to stop me. For I remembered Master Gallio's words, when he began to develop a fever in Achaia, and took ship at once, insisting that the disease was not of the body, but of the place. That is what I remarked to my dear Paulina, who always urges me to take care of my health. I know that her very life breath comes and goes with my own, and I am beginning in my solicitude for her, to be solicitous for myself. And although old age has made me braver to bear many things, I am gradually losing this boon that old age bestows. For it comes into my mind that in this old man there is a youth also, and youth needs tenderness. Therefore, since I cannot prevail upon her to love me any more heroically, she prevails upon me to cherish myself more carefully. For one must indulge genuine emotions, Sometimes, even in spite of weighty reasons, the breath of life must be called back and kept at our very lips, even at the price of great suffering, for the sake of those whom we hold dear, because the good man should not live as long as it pleases him, but as long as he ought. He who does not value his wife or his friend highly enough to linger longer in life, he who obstinately persists in dying, is a voluptuary. The soul should also enforce this command upon itself whenever the needs of one's relatives require. It should pause and humor those near and dear not only when it desires but even when it has begun to die. It gives proof of a great heart to return to life for the sake of others, and noble men have often done this. But this procedure also, I believe, indicates the highest type of kindness, that although the greatest advantage of old age is the opportunity to be more negligent regarding self-preservation and to use life more adventurously, one should watch over one's old age with still greater care if one knows that such action is pleasing, useful, or desirable in the eyes of a person whom one holds dear. This is also a source of no mean joy and profit. For what is sweeter than to be so valued by one's wife that one becomes more valuable to oneself for this reason? Hence my dear Paulina is able to make me responsible, not only for her fears, but also for my own. So you are curious to know the outcome of this prescription of travel? As soon as I escaped from the oppressive atmosphere of the city and from that awful odor of reeking kitchens which, when in use, pour forth a ruinous mess of steam and soot, I perceived at once that my health was mending. And how much stronger do you think I felt when I reached my vineyards? Being, so to speak, let out to pasture, I regularly walked into my meals, so I am my old self again feeling now no wavering languor in my system and no sluggishness in my brain. I am beginning to work with all my energy, but the mere place avails little for this purpose unless the mind is fully master of itself and can at its pleasure find seclusion even in the midst of business. The man, however, who is always selecting resorts and hunting for leisure, will find something to distract his mind in every place. Socrates is reported to have replied, when a certain person complained of having received no benefit from his travels. It serves you right, you travelled in your own company. Oh, what a blessing it would be for some men to wander away from themselves. As it is, they cause themselves vexation, worry, demoralization and fear. 
What profit is there in crossing the sea and in going from one city to another? If you would escape your troubles, you need not another place but another personality. Perhaps you have reached Athens, or perhaps Rhodes. Choose any state you fancy. How does it matter what its character may be? You will be bringing to it your own. Suppose that you hold wealth to be a good. Poverty will then distress you and, which is most pitiable, it will be an imaginary poverty. For you may be rich and nevertheless, because your neighbor is richer, you suppose yourself to be poor exactly by the same amount in which you fall short of your neighbor. You may deem official position a good. You will be vexed at another's appointment or reappointment to the consulship. You will be jealous whenever you see a name several times in the state records. Your ambition will be so frenzied that you will regard yourself last in the race if there is anyone in front of you. Or you may rate death as the worst of evils, although there is really no evil therein except that which precedes death's coming, fear. You will be frightened out of your wits, not only by real but by fancied dangers, and will be tossed forever on the sea of illusion. What benefit will it be to have threaded all the towns of Argolis, a fugitive through midmost press of foes? For peace itself will furnish further apprehension. Even in the midst of safety you will have no confidence if your mind has once been given a shock. Once it has acquired the habit of blind panic, it is incapable of providing even for its own safety. For it does not avoid danger, but runs away. Yet we are more exposed to danger when we turn our backs. You may judge it the most grievous of ills to lose any of those you love, while all the same this would be no less foolish than weeping, because the trees which charm your eye and adorn your home lose their foliage. Regard everything that pleases you as if it were a flourishing plant. Make the most of it while it is in leaf, for different plants at different seasons must fall and die. But just as the loss of leaves is a light thing, because they are born afresh, so it is with the loss of those whom you love, and regard as the delight of your life, for they can be replaced even though they cannot be born afresh. New friends, however, will not be the same. No, nor will you yourself remain the same. You change with every day and every hour. But in other men you more readily see what time plunders. In your own case the change is hidden, because it will not take place visibly. Others are snatched from sight. We ourselves are being stealthily filched away from ourselves. You will not think about any of these problems, nor will you apply remedies to these wounds. You will of your own volition be sowing a crop of trouble by alternate hoping and despairing. If you are wise, mingle these two elements. Do not hope without despair, or despair without hope. What benefit has travel of itself ever been able to give anyone? No restraint upon pleasure, no bridling of desire, no checking of bad temper, no crushing of the wild assaults of passion, no opportunity to rid the soul of evil. Traveling cannot give us judgment or shake off our errors. It merely holds our attention for a moment by a certain novelty, as children pause to wonder at something unfamiliar. Besides, it irritates us through the wavering of a mind which is suffering from an acute attack of sickness. The very motion makes it more fitful and nervous. Hence, the spots we had sought most eagerly, we quit still more eagerly, like birds that flit and are off as soon as they have alighted. What travel will give is familiarity with other nations. It will reveal to you mountains of strange shape, or unfamiliar tracts of plain, or valleys that are watered by ever-flowing springs, or the characteristics of some river that comes to our attention. We observe how the Nile rises and swells in summer, or how the Tigris disappears, runs underground through hidden spaces, and then appears with unabated sweep, or how the meander, at that oft-rehearsed theme and plaything of the poets, turns in frequent bendings, and often in winding comes close to its own channel before resuming its course. But this sort of information will not make better or sounder men of us. We ought rather to spend our time in study, and to cultivate those who are masters of wisdom, learning something which has been investigated but not settled. By this means the mind can be relieved of a most wretched serfdom and won over to freedom. Indeed, as long as you are ignorant of what you should avoid or seek, or of what is necessary or superfluous, or of what is right or wrong, you will not be traveling, but merely wandering. There will be no benefit to you in this hurrying to and fro, for you are traveling with your emotions and are followed by your afflictions. Would that they were indeed following you. In that case, 
they would be farther away, as it is you are carrying and not leading them. Hence they press about you on all sides, continually chafing and annoying you. It is medicine, not scenery, for which the sick man must go a-searching. Suppose that someone has broken a leg or dislocated a joint. He does not take carriage or ship for other regions, but he calls in the physician to set the fractured limb or to move it back to its proper place in the socket. What then? When the spirit is broken or wrenched in so many places, do you think that change of place can heal it? The complaint is too deep-seated to be cured by a journey. Travel does not make a physician or an orator. No art is acquired by merely living in a certain place. Where lies the truth then? Can wisdom, the greatest of all the arts, be picked up on a journey? I assure you, travel as far as you like. You can never establish yourself beyond the reach of desire, beyond the reach of bad temper, or beyond the reach of fear. Had it been so, the human race would long ago have banded together and made a pilgrimage to the spot. Such ills, as long as you carry with you their causes, will load you down and worry you to skin and bone in your wanderings over land and sea. Do you wonder that it is of no use to run away from them? That from which you are running is within you. Accordingly, reform your own self, get the burden off your own shoulders, and keep within safe limits the cravings which ought to be removed. Wipe out from your soul all trace of sin. If you would enjoy your travels, make healthy the companion of your travels. As long as this companion is avaricious and mean, greed will stick to you, and while you consort with an overbearing man, your puffed-up ways will also stick close. Live with a hangman, and you will never be rid of your cruelty. If an adulterer be your clubmate, he will kindle the baser passions. If you would be stripped of your faults, leave far behind you the patterns of the faults. The miser, the swindler, the bully, the cheat, who will do you much harm merely by being near you, are within you. Change therefore to better associations. Live with the Katos, with Lelius, with Tubero. Or, if you enjoy living with Greeks also, spend your time with Socrates and with Zeno. The former will show you how to die if it be necessary, the latter how to die before it is necessary. Live with Chrysippus, with Posidonius. They will make you acquainted with things earthly and things heavenly. They will bid you work hard over something more than neat turns of language and phrases mouthed forth for the entertainment of listeners. They will bid you be stout of heart and rise superior to threats. The only harbour safe from the seething storms of this life is scorn of the future, a firm stand, a readiness to receive fortune's missiles full in the breast, neither skulking nor turning the back. Nature has brought us forth brave of spirit and, as she has implanted in certain animals a spirit of ferocity, in others craft, in others terror, so she has gifted us with an aspiring and lofty spirit, which prompts us to seek a life of the greatest honour and not of the greatest security that most resembles the soul of the universe, which it follows and imitates as far as our mortal steps permit, this spirit thrusts itself forward, confident of commendation and esteem. It is superior to all, monarch of all its surveys. Hence it should be subservient to nothing, finding no task too heavy, and nothing strong enough to weigh down the shoulders of a man. Shapes dread to look upon, of toil or death, are not in the least dreadful, if one is able to look upon them with unflinching gaze and is able to pierce the shadows. Many a sight that is held a terror in the night time is turned to ridicule by day. Shapes dread to look upon, of toil or death. Our Virgil has excellently said that these shapes are dread, not in reality, but only to look upon. In other words, they seem terrible, but are not. And in these visions what is there, I say, as fear-inspiring as rumour has proclaimed? Why, pray, my dear Lucilius, should a man fear toil or a mortal death? Countless cases occur to my mind of men who think that what they themselves are unable to do is impossible, who maintain that we utter words which are too big for man's nature to carry out. But how much more highly do I think of these men? They can do these things, but decline to do them. To whom that ever tried have these tasks proved false? To what man did they not seem easier in the doing? Our lack of confidence is not the result of difficulty. The difficulty comes from our lack of confidence. If, however, you desire a pattern, 
Take Socrates, a long-suffering old man, who was sea-tossed amid every hardship and yet was unconquered both by poverty, which his troubles at home made more burdensome, and by toil, including the drudgery of military service. He was much tried at home, whether we think of his wife, a woman of rough manners and shrewish tongue, or of the children whose intractability showed them to be more like their mother than their father. And if you consider the facts, he lived either in time of war, or under tyrants, or under a democracy which is more cruel than wars and tyrants. The war lasted for 27 years. Then the state became the victim of the 30 tyrants, of whom many were his personal enemies. At the last came that climax of condemnation under the gravest of charges. They accused him of disturbing the state religion and corrupting the youth, for they declared that he had influenced the youth to defy the gods, to defy the council, and to defy the state in general. Next came the prison and the cup of poison. But all these measures changed the soul of Socrates so little that they did not even change his features. What wonderful and rare distinction! He maintained this attitude up to the very end, and no man ever saw Socrates too much elated or too much depressed. Amid all the disturbance of fortune, he was undisturbed. Do you desire another case? Take that of the younger Marcus Cato, with whom fortune dealt in a more hostile and more persistent fashion. But he withstood her on all occasions, and in his last moments at the point of death, showed that a brave man can live in spite of fortune, can die in spite of her. His whole life was passed either in civil warfare or under a political regime which was soon to breed civil war. And you may say that he, just as much as Socrates, declared allegiance to liberty in the midst of slavery, unless perchance you think that Pompey, Caesar and Crassus A were the allies of liberty. No one ever saw Cato change no matter how often the state changed. He kept himself the same in all circumstances, in the praetorship, in defeat, under accusation, in his province, on the platform, in the army, in death. Furthermore, when the Republic was in a crisis of terror, when Caesar was on one side with ten embattled legions at his call, aided by so many foreign nations, and when Pompey was on the other, satisfied to stand alone against all comers, and when the citizens were leaning towards either Caesar or Pompey, Cato alone established a definite party for the Republic. If you would obtain a mental picture of that period, you may imagine on one side the people and the whole proletariat eager for revolution, on the other the senators and knights, the chosen and honored men of the commonwealth, and there were left between them but these two, the Republic and Cato. I tell you, you will marvel when you see Atreus's son, and Priam, and Achilles, wroth at both. Like Achilles, he scorns and disarms each faction. And this is the vote which he casts concerning them both. If Caesar wins, I slay myself. If Pompey, I go into exile. What was there for a man to fear who, whether in defeat or in victory, had assigned to himself a doom which might have been assigned to him by his enemies in their utmost rage? So he died by his own decision. You see that man can endure toil. Cato on foot led an army through African deserts, you see that thirst can be endured. He marched over sun-baked hills, dragging the remains of a beaten army and with no train of supplies, undergoing lack of water and wearing a heavy suit of armor, always the last to drink of the few springs which they chanced to find. You see that honor and dishonor too can be despised, for they report that on the very day when Cato was defeated at the elections, he played a game of ball. You see also that man can be free from fear of those above him in rank, for Cato attacked Caesar and Pompey simultaneously at a time when none dared fall foul of the one without endeavoring to oblige the other. You see that death can be scorned as well as exile. Cato inflicted exile upon himself and finally death, and war all the while. And so, if only we are willing to withdraw our necks from the yoke, we can keep as stout a heart against such terrors as these. But first and foremost, we must reject pleasures. They render us weak and womanish. They make great demands upon us, and moreover, cause us to make great demands upon fortune. Second, we must spurn wealth. Wealth is the diploma of slavery. Abandon gold and silver, and whatever else is a burden upon our richly furnished homes. 
Liberty cannot be gained for nothing. If you set a high value on liberty, you must set a low value on everything else. Farewell.